I'm going to talk today about uh, Burning Man, how it influenced my work, my writing, how I think it changed me and a lot of people, and how it could change the world. And I first want to say, I'm actually not a big deal. Like, I'm a burner, but uh, you all are much more involved in this organization than I am. So I want to honor that and say that you're doing a lot of the things that I'm talking about. So uh, with all due respect to everything that you're doing, just some thoughts on how to take it uh, even farther. So I'm a science fiction writer. It's what I'm known for. I wrote this series of books, Nexus, Crux, Apex. And the conceit in the book is that there's a drug you can swallow that gets into your brain, and it's nanotech, and it creates sort of a Wi-Fi connection between brains. So people can exchange what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what they're thinking, what they're feeling from person to person. Right? Now, that's probably not a totally new concept to you, especially you're all smart people. So if you're up to date on the latest and greatest American philosophy, then you kind of have these concepts especially, especially if you know the work of recent great American philosophers like Keanu Reeves, <laughs> who, when data was digitally implanted into his brain, said you know, famously, I know Kung Fu. Um, We'll come back to that, because there's actually some cool-ass science I'm going to talk about in a bit. But first, I did win the, the Philip K. Dick Award uh, the other day, and it's awesome. Philip K. Dick wrote Blade Runner and uh, Do Android Dream of Electric Sheep and a whole bunch of other great work that you've seen. Uh, and so this is me getting it on stage. That's the, the runner-up, Marguerite Reed, who's also awesome. A funny thing happens when you win a, a Philip K. Dick Award, or a Dick, as we call it, because <laughs> That night, I went to a party. I came out of the bathroom, and a crowd of people congratulated me for my dick. And that, <laughs> that has never happened to me before in my life, actually. Or the next day, I had to go back to the sci-fi con, so I left my dick with my fiance, and she took it on adventure. She took my dick to the bookstore. She, she took my dick to dicks. She said they, they had some delicious dicks. Um, I've told more dick jokes. I told more dick jokes in the first 24 hours than I had in my entire life before. And they kind of write themselves. I'll, the, my dick got champagne spilled on it. Anyway, <laughs> so you might think that um, the goal of sci-fi is to predict the future, right? And it, it turns out sci-fi is crap at prediction. We really do a shitty-ass job of predicting what's going to come. But it's occasionally useful in provoking thoughts about the future. It's when it goes furthest out that it does the most good. So Corey Doctor talks about the idea, who's also a burner, by the way. Uh, Corey talks about the ideal of sci-fi being in the 50s and seeing the rise of the automobile and the rise of the movie theater and predicting not just the drive-in movie, but predicting the sexual revolution. Right? Like, that's provocative. And people would say, no, no way. You're like, that's crazy talk. And yet, it happens. And we, we mostly don't go that far. Uh, most sci-fi is about outer space, right? But I prefer writing about inner space, because it's where we all live, and there's a hell of a lot of stuff happening there. So my journey in writing about uh, writing sci-fi at all was seeing some stuff happening in actual science about connecting brains. Hey, by the way, the timer has not started yet, so you guys might want to get that going. Just so I know when to stop, because I can be here all day. <laughs> so we, um, we, it still hasn't started, but I'll just go. Um, so we've actually done some stuff in science that uh, looked sort of like the matrix to me. So for instance, uh, we've been getting data, digital data, into the human brain. So this is a cochlear implant. Anybody have a cochlear implant or know somebody who does? OK, yeah. So like a hearing aid picks up sounds, cleans them up, and then it has a microphone that sends more sounds into the, into the ear, and they're vibrations, right? And so inner ear hair cells pick up these vibrations, and that creates a signal in your nervous system. But if you have no inner ear hair cells left, no amount of vibration works. So a cochlear implant picks up sound with a microphone, but then it sends an electronic signal into the auditory nerve, which is just trippy that it works at all. Uh, and there's now about 200,000 people in the world that are cyborgs in this way, like this uh, little girl or the six-month-old boy you're about to see uh, hearing the first sound ever in his life.
talk to Sucking. Hi. Good. Could you hear that? <laughs> Hi, sweetie. So, yeah, pretty cool, huh? Like, Jonathan there, he's a cyborg, but he's like the cutest damn cyborg you ever saw. Like, this is not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, so I saw that, I'm like, whoa, that's cool, but I must stop there. But then this thing happened. This is the cover of Wired magazine like 10 years ago. It's a guy named Jens. He's 39 years old at this time. He went blind in a series of accidents. At 18, he was working on a train line with a pickaxe, and his axe hit some metal, and a metal sliver came up and destroyed one eye. The next year, he was out snowboarding, didn't want to compromise on his outdoorsy life lifestyle. He had a snowmobile accident, and a piece of clutch flew up and destroyed his other eye. Right? Totally sucked. But he went on with his life. And then, age 39, doctors fitted him with this. This is a, a digital camera worn on his glasses. And it gets the signals, it processes them, it translates them. And that goes to this jack in the back of his skull that goes to primary visual cortex, the part of your brain that, that first processes images from your eyes. And there's a few billion neurons in primary visual cortex alone, and this thing has 256 wires, right? It's not a whole lot of data coming in, but it's enough that he could get what they called limited functional mobility. And what is that? Well, here's what that looks like. I was able to very carefully drive and look from my left side to my right side, making sure I was between the row of trees on the right and the building on the left. When I got near um, any obstruction in the front, I would see that there was an obstruction. I would also see the lack of obstructions. And then when I backed up, I would be able to um, inspect for instructions there. It was really a nice feeling. It was really a nice feeling. So, so that's a guy who was blind for 20 years driving a convertible. Now, you'll notice there's nobody else in the car. There's no cars in the parking lot. Like, his, his vision completely sucked. It was 16 pixel by 16 pixel grayscale. But it was a proof of concept that we could do something. We could take digital data and import it into the brain. So I was like, whoa. Uh, or we've gotten data out. Uh, this is a guy named Johnny Ray. He was paralyzed uh, from the neck down. They put a single implant in the motor cortex, a part of his brain that controlled his right hand, and he could spell out words on an on-screen uh, keyboard. Or these guys have taken patients, put them in an MRI machine, like you get in the hospital, and they've shown them a video, and then used software to try to figure out what they're looking at. And it's not perfect, but the software can kind of tell without any wires, just by peering at their brain activity, what sort of thing they're looking at. And yeah, it is crazy. Yeah, that's right. And this is great for tinfoil hat people, too. Like, <laughs> we're all in a giant MRI machine, and the CIA is reading our thoughts. Now, they're just reading your, your emails and, and Facebook posts. Uh, so yeah, so wild ass things were happening. And we've also started augmenting people's, well, at least animal brains a little bit. Anybody know what movie this is from? Very good. What's the name of the actor? Guy Pierce. Excellent. What's the name of the character? Lenny. My, nobody ever gets that. You guys are good. OK, it's a film about, about memory, right? So Lenny can't form new long-term memories. He sees stuff. It loads up. But a few minutes later, it's gone, right? And that's a severe case, but there's actually hundreds of thousands of cases like that with lesser uh, degrees of symptoms. And it's when you have damaged a part of your brain called the hippocampus that takes the incoming data and helps facilitate it getting into long-term memory. So these guys at USC have created a hippocampus chip. And they've taken rats that have damage to that part of the brain, and they basically put in a bypass with this chip. And then the rats can't learn when they have the damage, but they can learn when they have the chip. All right? Awesome. Two, rats normally live like two or three years. So they've taken a rat, run it through a maze, stored all the data that came off the chip. And then like a year later, when the rat would normally have completely forgotten the maze, they've played back the data from the chip and put the rat in front of the maze, and it runs it like it just saw it five minutes ago. All right, so they're storing memories. So you've got rats with super memories to some extent. Or uh, these rhesus monkeys, these macaques, have a chip in their frontal cortex, the part of the brain that does pattern matching, the closest thing to, to sort of IQ, if you will. 
And this chip learns what's going on as they play a game. It's called a pick and match game. They're shown some pictures, and then they're shown a high speed blur of pictures, and they have to pick out just the ones that they saw before and not the wrong ones. And it's actually a really challenging game, even for humans. So they, the chip learns like what a good neural circuit looks like when they get the answer right versus what it looks like when they get the answer wrong. Then they impair the performance of the monkeys on the test. They impair it by giving them large doses of cocaine. <laughs> so the monkeys all think they've gotten a lot better, but in fact, their performance is going down. <clears throat> then they put the chip in an active mode, where when it sees a neural circuit forming that it associates with a wrong answer, it can intervene, it can prod it and try to change that, and it can completely rescue the negative effect of the coke. Right? And what's more than that, if they do that to a monkey and don't give it the cocaine, on a 100-point scale, they can give it about a 10-point boost in its performance on this test. So you get the planet of the super-intelligent uh, cyborg apes. Probably not. And then most trippy, and what influenced my work the most, was connecting brains. So the, the day that my second book came out, these guys at the University of Washington did this experiment uh, where <clears throat> they're in separate buildings about a mile apart on campus, and they're playing a video game. Okay? But they're not playing in multiplayer mode. They're not playing head-to-head. -head. They're not playing cooperative. They're playing as a single player. And what's happening is that uh, Rajesh Rao on the left can see the screen, but he has no controller, except for the EEG skull cap. And his, uh, his colleague on the right there uh, has the fire button, but has no screen and doesn't know what's going on. <clears throat> so when Rajesh sees uh, a bad guy, you've got to shoot the bad guys, not the good guys. When Rajesh sees a bad guy, he thinks, shoot. And what happens is that this magnetic pulse stimulator on Andrea Stoko's head creates a current running through just the right part of his brain, and his right finger twitches. He, he does not feel like, oh, I feel a tingling, I should shoot now. No, he just, his finger twitches, and he's like, I just shot. So his, his hand has become sort of part of uh, Rajesh Rao's brain. Or uh, this guy, this guy, Miguel Nicolelis, one of the, the premier guys in the field, did this experiment with two rats. Two rats in, in two separate cages, and they have implants in the, their motor cortex that controls their paws. <clears throat> one rat gets trained. When certain lights light up, you pull the right lever, you get a reward. The other rat, and that rat does it perfectly, basically. The other rat has never been trained and is kind of just confused or sits around. But when they flip the switch to connect their implants, suddenly the rat that's never been trained starts pulling the right lever, All right? That's cool. What's even cooler is where they are, because one rat is in Nicolelis' uh, laboratory at Duke in North Carolina, and the other is at his other lab in Sao Paulo, Brazil because once you can make it digital, you can send it anywhere, right? Or the guys at USC, the, the hippocampus chip, the, the cat rats store their memories, they talked about for years, what would happen if we had two rats with chips and we let data go from one rat to the other? If one rat ran the maze, would the other rat learn? And I was like, I hope they eventually do that. They did it last year and it worked. When one rat ran the maze and the data flowed to the other rat's brain, the other rat could run the maze. Not quite as well as the first rat, but it just learned. It was kind of like, I know Kung Fu, right? So my response to all of that was, oh. <laughs> Keanu's my bestie here. Um, another Philip K. Dick uh, book, actually, A Scan of Darkling. Um, all right, so that's, that's the sort of the science that led to my art. But it was also Burning Man that led to what I wrote. So my first burn was 97. This is what the man looked like then. Uh, this is the only Burning Man picture I will show that is not mine, actually. It was on private land. There was grass where I camped. It was weird ass shit. I didn't know it was that weird. Uh, and then some friends, when I turned 25, got me a joke cult for my birthday. And we assumed it would last just a few months. But we had loved Burning Man so much. We're like, let's go back to Burning Man in 98. And then somebody's like, what should our theme camp be? And so the Church of Mez was born. Uh, mo in most cults, I think like the money flows towards the cult leader. And I, so I think there was something wrong with our business practices or, or something, because <clears throat> it didn't really work that way. Uh, but you know, we did all the usual things. We bought a bus. Uh, we, we painted it weird colors. We made art. Uh, we always liked to make tall things. So that's why Kay could find her way home. We made a lot of friends. Yes, absolutely. And before this, I was a shy dude. Like, I was smart. I was whatever. But my 
I had no confidence. My external life, my ability to interact with new people was nil. But it's not nil, but very low. But somehow in the course of going to the burn a few times, I remember like striking up a conversation with a lovely young lady at the porta potty. I was like, whoa, I just did that. I just talked to somebody. Like, <laughs> I changed, right? I became, I became this dude, and my, my personal experience of the world changed. Like, I started to have different ways of interacting with the world. I experienced new emotions I did not experience before, right? So what does it mean? What does it mean? Um, so I'm big into meaning. And here's my, my view of what anything means. The meaning of a thing is the change that thing causes in the world. The meaning of a word is the change it causes in your brain when you read it. The meaning of a book is the change it causes in you. So what's the meaning of the burn? Like the meaning of, of this experience is what all of these people take out of that experience. And I think in that respect, Burning Man has already had a dramatic impact on the world, a dramatic positive impact on the world by changing thousands of people, by allowing for change and expansion. Maybe more than thousands of people, maybe millions of people actually. This is my friend Jesse Robbins, you might know him, he's a, a firefighter on the playa, and Jesse would not be offended to hear me say that he's a type A personality and is a very controlled, uh, ratcheted up person, uh, but he's a little bit less than he used to be, and it's because of Burning Man. I, just, I think these pictures reflect sort of the, the experiences that he's had over time. Everyone can expand. Everyone can grow into new emotions. Everyone can change, right? And I think Burning Man facilitates that. Anais Nin says that uh, life expands or contracts in proportion to one's courage. And that's true, but I think there's more than that. Life can expand when your horizons expand. When someone or something shows you what's out there over the horizon that you thought you had. Life can expand based on your community, your shared experiences, right? Life can expand off your role models. Whether you're a geek who sees somebody who's also geeky doing something cool, or you're a woman who never thought you could be the one with the sledgehammer, piling the, the driving the nails into the ground, right? Life expands with your peak experiences that Burning Man facilitates. And that's true even for people that have never been to the burn. My friend Mason went to the burn for the first time in 2000, and he was one of the few people who told me that it was not a life-changing experience. But it was not because he had been living for three or four years in a burner culture in Seattle, where the life-changing aspects had already gotten out to him. For people that have never been to the burn but see that it exists and see that that sort of experience or life or activity is possible, that creates a new potential uh, landmark for them. It creates a new ideal of what's possible for them. And I want to bring this back to my writing. So when I wrote Nexus, I wanted to write about this neurotech stuff, right? But I've been going to Burning Man for years and years. So I imagine the people who uh, drove it were people like burners. I didn't actually ever mention Burning Man in the book, but if you read it, it's, it's basically burners. Uh, <laughs> And it was people who at the burn do you know, crazy science or, or a cool projects. So it's sort of a merger of, of Burning Man plus Neurotech. Or somebody reviewed it and said it's Tom Clancy meets Burning Man. And, and there's a long history of the counterculture driving innovation, right? And it's not it's like, <laughs> I, I, I think this cartoon was meant to be cynical, uh, but it fails because the reality is like, People who have lived in the counterculture have driven, you know, from the creation of the, the mouse and the basic metaphor of the mouse and the screen and the bitmap screen to Steve Jobs. And it's not just about dropping acid, it's about being in this experience. Stuart Brand and the whole Earth catalog, the counterculture has driven huge technological innovations and societal ones. And I wanted my characters to be part of that and to be part of a tribe. Right, the way that I see the people that I know being parts of tribes, I wanted them to experience profound emotional uh, gravitas. This is the shame project, the project we did in 2011, where thousands of people wrote what they were most ashamed of and then saw what other people had written, and a lot of people came out of that changed. I wanted them to experience a sense of awe, per, like awe at all scales, because that's what 
makes life rich to me. And so the extent that I uh, won this award, it's because I took everything I knew about life, a whole lot of which I had learned from Burning Man, and poured it into my work. And I'm sort of a vector for uh, Burning Man culture, without even ever being labeled that, getting out into the world. I'll say one more thing about writing art, which is all art is political. So I think the drug war is bullshit. I think the war on terror is bullshit. I think there are terrible abrogations of our rights. And it doesn't matter if you agree with me or not, but in being somebody who is putting art out there, I channeled that into my art, right? Because I wanted my art to change the world in some way. I view that the, the meaning of my books is what impact do they have on the world? How do they make the world a little bit different? Or maybe a lot different? OK, so what the heck does that mean for Burning Man and where now for Burning Man? And I want to say that I, everything I'm about to say, I'll probably say loudly and forcefully, but I want to say it with humility, because you all are the ones actually doing it. And there's a huge number of awesome projects that I know about, and probably an even huger number of awesome projects that I don't know about that are doing this. But I just want to give you some thoughts of somebody who's been to the burn a lot uh, on things that we could do. So what's the meaning of Burning Man is the change Burning Man causes in the world. Now, we are part of the world. Change it drives in us is part of that meaning. But there's a wider world as well. So my other job is I teach at this place called Singularity University. And we talk a lot about trends in technology. We talk about grand challenges. We talk about things like poverty and climate change and water and energy and inequality. And what are these challenges that affect a huge number of people? And so a lot of my time is actually spent speaking to audiences about uh, what is happening with things like climate change. Well, what's happening is not good. 2014 was the hottest year ever recorded on Earth. 2015 blew that away. All right, 2016 might. Uh, February 2016, last month, was the warmest month ever recorded by a huge margin. We're seeing real impacts now. And uh, we want, we set this goal of two degrees Celsius. We've warned about one. But business as usual, our current path puts us up here. And that's like some, some nightmare shit right there. It's not the end of humanity, but it's really not pretty in any way. And to try to have any hope of getting it uh, down to that two degrees Celsius, we can only burn about a quarter of the fossil fuels that we know about, right? So that's a very, very serious challenge. Or air pollution. I've, I've spoken in China a number of times. There, people can touch and feel the challenges every day. Or fresh water. Anybody know what this body of water is? It's the RLC. Lake Chad's a good guess. The RLC is actually a lake, though it's called a sea, uh, the fourth largest body of fresh water in the world, about the size of all the Great Lakes combined. Or it was until it got sucked dry, all right? Uh, more than a billion people live in a situation of water insecurity around the world, most of them in, in Asia, but it's going to grow in sub-Saharan Africa as well. And climate change will make drought worse, even as we have to grow more food and so on and so forth. Those are environmental issues. But what about uh, social issues? This is in Brazil. This is one of the richest neighborhoods in Brazil, and this is a favela. Right? We have inequality issues in the US, uh, but they're, they're also grave in other places. Or this is a neighborhood in Detroit. Right? So what can we do about this sort of issue? And that's not good for people, and it's not good for any of us. Or uh, justice, frankly, and justice and injustice. This is Ferguson. I love this. This guy was uh, convicted, and I, he's appealing right now, but it looks like he's actually going to go to jail for throwing back a tear gas canister that the police fired at this crowd that was exercising their First Amendment rights, in my view. Uh, or this is the, the most Orwellian photo I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can't, you can't put this shit in fiction, by the way. Like, I could not say, or it would just be too ironic, right? Like, that's not believable. Um, so I'm an optimist, actually. I believe that we will address the bulk of those Issues. Because I talk a lot about environment, let me give you an environmental example. Anybody here from Ohio? OK, so this is the, the Cuyahoga River that, that flows through <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio. Nice bucolic place. This is what it looked like in 1968. You could stick your hand into this river and come out covered in oil and gunk and refuse. You could see the, the like pieces of garbage just floating on the river. And it's because uh, 
the river was uh, surrounded by factories and warehouses. The factories and warehouses situated there because the river offered low cost transportation. So you're running a business, awesome, I can get my goods in and out uh, more easily. But it also offered zero cost waste disposal, just dump it into the river, right? Zero cost for you, some cost for anybody downstream of you. That was a, a flaw in capitalism, if you will. 1969, a train crosses a bridge over this river and its metal wheels on the metal track throw a spark. I see some nods. The spark drifts down onto the river surface and the Cuyahoga catches on fire. Right? That was some fucked up shit. This is, <laughs> sorry, I, nor, with most audiences I keep those inside, but here I can. <clears throat> So this was the 13th time the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. The, the, that's by lore. The 12th time was during World War II, but this time there was color television, The Tonight Show uh, joked about it, a top 40 song was written about it. Uh, and in the next four years, we created the EPA, we passed the Clean Water Act, we passed the Clean Air Act, right? And now, uh, this is the Cuyahoga River, outside of Cleveland, like you can drink out of it. 27 of the 30 species that have disappeared of fish are back in the river. Like we can fix this sort of thing. Well here's smog in New York City or LA or London. Smog in London killed tens of thousands of people in the 60s. Uh, it's as bad, it was as bad then as it is in Shanghai or Shenzhen or Beijing uh, or Mumbai today. Uh, and now it's not, right? Because we acted. Or well, anybody here remember the ozone hole? It's, it's real, it's still there. Uh, we woke up to the ozone layer thinning. It wasn't just the whole around Antarctica. Around the entire globe, the ozone layer was thinning. And ozone, by the way, protects us from UV radiation, and UV radiation breaks down DNA. So no ozone layer and all life on the surface of the Earth goes away. Obviously, it wouldn't have ever gotten quite that far. The ozone layer is now healing. It takes decades to rebuild ozone, but it's healing a little bit ahead of schedule, we think. Uh, and it's healing because we did the impossible. We created an international agreement to phase out these chemicals like Freon and other CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, that destroy ozone. It's called the Montreal Protocol. Industry said it would cost hundreds of billions of dollars. You couldn't do it. Uh, your air conditioner in your car would never be cold again, and people would die because medicines in hospitals could not be kept cold. But none of that shit happened. Like. <laughs> We just did it. And in fact, smart businesses made a lot of money. They're like, oh, there's gonna be a need for a coolant that does not destroy ozone. Let's get on that, right? Like, or in climate, like climate change is incredibly severe, but we have this incredible progress happening. I talk a lot about solar. So the price of a solar module when I was born was more than $100 per watt. And now it's like 36 cents a watt. And so in places like Palo Alto in California, or just, you know, just south of here, uh, just bought power from LA uh, solar farm at half the cost of natural gas or coal electricity. So in sunny places, crazy ass shit is happening. And the only things that get cheap this fast, by the way, normally are like electronics. This does not normally apply to the physical world, but it is, right? Or we solved huge social injustice too. We, don't, we forget what Jim Crow was like. Like, oh, you can't apply for this job because you have the wrong skin color. Oh, uh, Ruby here, first girl in New Orleans, first colored girl in New Orleans to go to a white school, had to be escorted by federal marshals. That's what desegregation was like. Like, things were really, really, really bad. And it's not like we've ended racism or anything like it, but we've made huge strides. But the thing to understand is those, that progress on all of those things did not happen by accident. Right? It's like, I'm a techno-optimist, but there's a, a species of that which is, oh, it'll just take care of itself. The technology will get better, it'll solve all our problems. No, it happened because people set their minds to it. They saw, said, this is a problem, and I intend to fix it. There's optimism that is just, oh, it'll get better. Then there's optimism that is active optimism, which is, this will get better because I and my friends and my community are gonna make it better. And that's what it took. It took intention, identifying the problem, going after it. It took effort. Lots of effort, repeated failures, usually in these cases. It took organization of many people coming together. And society flips out when people try to do this, by the way. Uh, there's the amygdala in our brain. It's been there for uh, tens of millions of years. And largely, it treats the new as a threat. 
Because when you were, uh, uh, when we were on the savanna, if there was a rustling in the woods or in the, in the grass, nine times out of 10 it was nothing, but one time out of 10 it was a tiger. And so you had to react with every, to every new thing as a possible threat or you would get eaten. So we're wired to see the new uh, as scary, or most of society is. People in this room might be wired slightly differently. Uh, our brains are built, we've had a long time since we've had an upgrade, right? It's, there's a lot of old firmware and old programming baked into our genes of how these things work, and it's stuff that evolved to help us survive in a world where we knew tens of people and where nothing changed over the course of our lifetimes, and we, not a world where we had billions we could talk to and things were changing all the time. So society uh, sees exuberant people celebrating, this is Woodstock, and freaks out. Right? Society sees somebody who's different. These are, are gay men after the Stonewall riots, uh, and society freaks out. But that organization and that solidarity and that celebration is what it takes to actually make the change. So what can burners do? And again, I wanted to say, I say this with humility because a lot of this is happening right now. But I think you all especially, from a global perspective, who are helping form communities in local areas all around the world have some of the greatest power in this and not just the national organization. I think five things. One is experiment, right? They say the definition of insanity is to continue to do the same thing uh, even after it fails, right? I think that's a little bit exaggerated. Sometimes you have to keep, keep trying in overwhelming odds, but you also have to try new things <laughs> and see what works. That's what science is, it's we'll try five things. Whichever one works, that's the good one. We'll try that more, right? So there is a history of Burning Man. I'm a burner, I, I love it, but maybe there are new ways to do certain things and we shouldn't be a try, afraid to try them and we shouldn't be a, afraid to fail. That's the key thing here, is that, yeah, progress does not happen unless someone is willing to take a risk and get something wrong. That's the only way you get to things that are right. Right, or here's Darwin. Everyone knows that uh, he talked about the you know, evolution and the fittest of the species, but he actually said it was the most adaptable to change that prospered in the long term. And so we live in a changing world. How does Burning Man change? How do your local organizations change? We can't be afraid of that. To inspire, Burning Man already does this like nobody's business, but in the context of making change outside of just the playa or the regional burns, inspire. And that means not just focusing on little incremental changes, but on the big things you want to accomplish, on the high order vision, on a dream of what is possible, even if that is possible over the course of a generation, and it's gonna take multiple steps. This is a great quote, make no little plans. They have no power to move the hearts of men and will fail. Right? Big plans are the ones, big dreams simply expressed are the ones that actually get people uh, passionate and get them moving. Three include, what kind of people are we not including? I think we've done a better and better job of including people of different age groups. It's my friend uh, Mike Tyka's parents celebrating their wedding anniversary in the playa. Uh, but we could do more of that. Why is this so focused on a certain age demographic? Or how do we include more people of color? in the burn because they're facing some serious injustice that most of us are probably passionate about. Is there some way to do that? Or what does the playa mean for someone living in a developing world country or somebody living in a very rigidly socially con controlled country? How do we include more of those people? For organize. We can bring 60,000 people together in a very organized, coherent way on the playa, right? That sort of organization is what it takes to affect change outside of the playa as well. And those skills that we've developed for this are critical skills to people driving citizen initiatives or for changes to their community or starting new nonprofits or any other change or organizing a protest or any other change that you want to have in the world whatsoever. And five, engage. And what I mean by engage is, you know, there's a sign out there that says, welcome home, awesome. I love it. The playa it feels like home to me in a way that nothing else does, and our regional burn does as well. But most of the time, we live in the default world, right? We live in communities uh, where we are not the only ones, and where there are social laws and rules and so on uh, that govern us. So we need to engage, I think, 
I would urge you to think about engaging in that. How do you make a change in your community? How do you make a change, not just nationally, but in the city, the town, the county, the state that you live in? These guys might not have had the right idea. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I would have picked the way they went about doing this. <laughs> Selling pot pipes to make uh, donations for Bernie. And I'm not sure if they meant Bernie here in the Burning Man sense or not, but this is not exactly what I had in mind. But there is a lot of stuff uh, that we can all do. And by the way, the secret, a secret they don't tell you about this stuff is it can actually be quite fun. Uh, there's a feeling of, of solidarity in all of this. So I want to come back and just close sort of by saying that sci-fi has sucked about predicting what's happened, right? We, very few people predicted the sexual revolution. But it's not just that. The sci-fi writers of the 50s and the 60s didn't predict the civil rights movement. Right? They didn't predict the anti-war movement. The sci-fi writers of last generation or of 10 years ago didn't predict the way that uh, electronic tools would be huge driving forces for revolution. No one predicted uh, the Arab Spring. And that didn't end quite the way we wanted to, but nobody predicted that people in these rigidly controlled societies would stand up and say, fuck you, you're not a government anymore. Right? They haven't learned how to govern yet, but they've learned they can kick out tyrants if they don't like it. Uh, no one, I never saw sci-fi predicting Black Lives Matter or anything like that. I didn't see it predicting uh, the way that the internet could make us immediately in an environment and feel injustice that had always been there, right? Police did not start uh, killing more black people when Twitter was invented. Like, they were already doing it, but now we can, we can spread, we can organize. And what I'm saying here is there's all this positive social change happening. Um, and even when governments try to stop it. I'm, it's funny, on, on, on Weibo, the Chinese Twitter, uh, you can criticize the government to some extent. What you can't do is organize. You can't organize people together. Because what the forces, the entrenched forces fear most in China or anywhere is the power of people who come together to affect change. And yet, uh, this is a, an environmental protest in Dalian, China. A couple of years ago, they were protesting a new chemical plant organized over text message. Uh, and by the way, when, you're, when one of these is happening, if they think you're going to go, you will often get a text message that says, oh, the protest tomorrow, it's been called off. Don't go. But we all know who, the, who sent that. Uh, and these protesters won, actually. So we tend to have the, this dystopian vision of what uh, technology or social change will do. You know, 1984, and there's some, some terrible uses of, of technology as well. If you follow my Twitter feed, you'll probably see me bitching about the NSA on a regular basis. Uh, but we never saw that the ability of people to come together would mean that these guys could get married, right? And again, that took effort. This, this is the explosion of marriage equality across the country. Splooge. Um, <laughs> but two things. This, this did not happen by accident. It took a hell of a lot of work. And at the same time, once people did start working at it, it happened a hell of a lot faster than anyone thought it could happen. And I think that's true of a lot of things. It's true of, of, of pot legalization, potentially. It's true. This is how fast America changes its mind on, on all sorts of things. Women having the right to vote, interracial marriage, abortion rights, uh, and now um, gay marriage, and then maybe pot legalization next. I don't know. But these things happen when people come together, when they're connected, when they're connected electronically, when they're connected in their communities, when they're connected in events like the burn or events like their regional events, that bringing people together, sharing inspiration, sharing ideas, uh, forming a joint intent to go after something and make a change is what drives those changes. So the meaning of Burning Man to me is the change that it can have in the world. We are part of that. It's already had huge meaning by changing us. Uh, but there's more, I think, that can be done. And uh, we are the ones that we have been waiting for. So that is it. Thank you.